Hello there geographers and welcome to the first unit summary video for AP Human Geography. In this video we will be reviewing all of the major concepts that you need to know from unit one of AP Human Geography. Now before we get started I need you to click the link in the description of this video to get the study guide that goes along with the video. The study guide can be found in my ultimate review packet. It goes along with this video and will make sure that you remember all of the major concepts in this unit. When you get the study guide don't forget to check out the rest of the packet as well. The packet has unit review videos for each unit, practice quizzes, study guides, answer keys, full practice AP exams, FRQ resources, important vocab lists, exclusive videos, and other resources to help you get not only an A in your class, but a five on the national exam. So now that you have your study guide out and you are ready to go, let's review unit one. Now the first part of this unit is all about maps. And right away we need to remember that whenever we are looking at a map, we are looking at a distorted image of the globe. Every map projection has distortion in either the direction, shape, area, or distance. This happens because you can't take a three-dimensional object such as a globe and perfectly project it onto a two-dimensional surface. There are hundreds and hundreds of different map projections, and each of them have different uses. But for AP Human Geography, you only have to be familiar with a few. The Mercator map projection is a conformal projection and is excellent at showing accurate direction, which is one of the reasons why it was used for naval expeditions. But this projection has significant distortion in the size and location of landmass, which we can clearly see when looking at Greenland and Africa. The map gives the illusion that Greenland is larger than Africa, when in reality Africa is more than 14 times larger than Greenland. The good Hamelstein projection is an equal area pseudo-cylindrical projection. It does a great job at showing the true size and shape of land masses, but has distortion in distances near the edges of the map and is not helpful for direction since it is an interrupted map. Remember, interrupted maps try to remove remove distortion by removing parts of the globe, while uninterrupted maps do not remove any parts of the globe, which may cause more distortion in some areas of the map. The Robinson projection has more distortion near the poles, which helps preserve the size and shape of land maps. But in its effort to minimize distortion, it ends up spreading the distortion out across the entire map for all areas. Next is the Gall Peters projection, which is one of the more accurate map projections at showing the true size of the Earth's land Masses. But at the same time, this projection does have significant distortion with the shape of land masses and also direction. Remember, the fundamental problem that every map has is distortion. Moving on from map projections to types of maps, we can see there are two broad categories. Reference maps and thematic maps. Reference maps are informational maps. These maps show boundaries, the toponym, and geographic features of a place. Reference maps are often used for directions, to display property lines, political boundaries, elevation changes, public transportation routes, or to show key features of a place. One type of reference map you'll want to be familiar with is a topographic map. These maps use contour lines to display the terrain and elevation changes in an area. The closer the lines are together, the steeper the terrain is. The more space there is between the lines, the less elevation is changing. Now before we move on to thematic maps, I want to quickly review absolute and relative distance, and also direction. Absolute direction is the the exact direction you are heading. For example, if you were traveling south, the compass would be at 180 degrees, while relative direction depends on the surrounding area. For example, here you can see that the yellow circle is north of the blue circle. Notice the direction depends on the location of the other circle. Now, absolute distance is the exact distance between two places. It's normally measured in miles or kilometers, and relative distance is the approximate measurement between two places. For example, if you want to drive from Minneapolis to Orlando, it would take about 23 hours. Next, we have thematic maps, which display spatial patterns of places and use quantitative data to display specific topics. Throughout AP Human Geography, you will see a variety of different thematic maps. Chloropleth maps display data by using different colors or different shades of color, with each color or shade of a color showing a different quantity of the data set. Dot density maps show data by placing points on a map where the data is occurring. This allows the reader to see the spatial distribution of data, but can be confusing
using if the data is clustered together. Remember, when we are using spatial analysis, we will come across information that is clustered together. For example, notice on the screen right now, these circles have little space between them. The circles here are packed together. But if we spread the circles out over a geographic area, we can see that now the circles are dispersed. You will hear these terms come up throughout the entire year, so make sure you are familiar with them. For example, when looking at this dot density map of the United States, we can see that people are more clustered together in the East Coast and are more dispersed in areas such as the Dakotas or states like Wyoming, Montana, or Nebraska. Going on to our next thematic map, we have a graduated symbol map, which uses shapes, items, or symbols to show the location and the amount of data. These maps can be very visual, but sometimes can be confusing due to the overlapping information. Isoline maps use lines to connect different areas that have similar or equal amounts of data. A common example of this would be a weather map that shows areas with similar temperatures. Then there is a cartogram map, which shows data in a dynamic way with the greatest value represented by the largest area. For example, we can see in this cartogram that China and India have larger populations than Canada and Bahrain. Lastly, there are flow line maps, which are great at showing the movement of different goods, people, animals, services, or ideas between different places. Now, while being able to identify these maps is one thing, it's more important that you understand how to read them. So once you're done with this video, go back to my ultimate review packet and take the map quiz. Once you finish the quiz, you can also check out my video breaking down each question. So we've been talking about maps and looking at different ways they can be used, but we need to also go over geographic data, how it is collected, and also how it is categorized. One of the ways in which geographers can collect data is through remote sensing, which is a process of collecting information about the world from satellites that are orbiting the Earth. This information can help us better understand changes that occur in different places over time and can be used in geographic information systems to create thematic maps, which help us better understand spatial patterns. Remember, a GIS is a computer system that can collect, analyze, and display geographic data. It creates layered maps, which gives geographers insight into the spatial associations and patterns of a place. Satellites are also helpful at providing absolute location through the global positioning system, or GPS for short. Today, people use GPS to help navigate between different places or to find specific spots on the Earth's surface. These three different technologies are all known as geospatial technologies, and they allow different businesses, people, governments, and also organizations to locate places and visualize geographic data. But those are not the only ways in which geographers collect data. There are also field observations, which are done by having people visit a place in the real world and record their first-hand observation, which is great at getting accurate data, but can also be costly and sometimes hard to get. Another in-person or sometimes digital approach to gathering data is through personal interviews. Here, geographers can learn about a place and collect individuals' unique perspectives by asking different questions to gain insight into an area. Media reports can also be used to better understand what people in an area are experiencing and what is happening to that area. Newspapers, online articles, or local news stations all give different insights into a place. More data can be collected by looking at government documents. The laws that are put in place in an area show cultural values and priorities. They also provide insight into the different systems that govern a place, which can help geographers better understand what happened at a place, what is happening now, and what might happen in the future. Then there are travel narratives, which unlike government documents or media reports, show a more personal personal perspective. Here, geographers can gain insight into individuals' experiences and observations of places while they were visiting or living in the area. Lastly, we can see data be acquired through landscape analysis and photo analysis. This helps geographers better understand changes to an area and can show the impacts humans may have had on the environment. This is done by studying images captured by geospatial technology, looking at photographs, or observing video recordings of a place. Here, geographers can look at wildlife, vegetation, the geography, and other physical elements of a place. Photo analysis is a skill you will definitely want to be familiar with for both your class and for the national exam. Now, before we go on to talk about different types of data, I want to make sure you're comfortable with doing photo analysis. Pause this video and complete the table in your study guide. Once you're done with the video, you'll be able to go and check the answer key in the ultimate review packet to make sure that you're understanding these concepts. All right, so when we look at data, we can see there are two main categories of data, qualitative data and quantitative quantitative data. Qualitative data is information that is often in word form and is up for interpretation, debate, 
exchange and discussion. This data is subjective and will differ depending on who is collecting it and how it is being collected. This type of data is often collected through observations and interviews. An example of this data would be the approval rating of your school's lunch food. Notice here that the information will differ every time you conduct your survey. While on the other hand, quantitative data is often in number form and is not up for debate. This information is concrete and is objective, not subjective. This information may be collected by a country census, which is an official count of a population, which includes a variety of demographic data, such as age, education level, housing status, sex, and more. An example of this data would be the demographic breakdown of India, where we could look at the population pyramid to better understand how many people are in each age cohort. If you do need more help with practicing qualitative and quantitative data, you can also find exclusive videos and resources in the Ultimate Review Packet to help you practice these concepts. Okay, so we've covered now how to collect geographic data, but now we need to talk about what we can use that geographic data for. To start, we have to remember that when we change our scale, we gain different insight into geographic data, which makes sense. If I'm looking at a local scale, I'm not seeing much of the Earth's surface, but I'm able to see lots of details of an area. This would be great for understanding exactly where data points are occurring, but if I change my scale to a national scale, I lose some of the finer details. However, I am now able to see different spatial relationships occurring within a country's boundary. Lastly, if we use a small scale map and look at a global scale, we are able to see even more patterns, but also end up relying more on generalization. Governments use geographic data to better understand their constituents' needs and to better understand how to plan for the future. If we look at the local level, we can see city governments use quantitative and qualitative data to make decisions about zoning to plan for the future growth of their settlement. To do this, they will look at data such as population changes to understand the needs of their residents. For example, if the population is very young, they will need to get funding for a new school. Or if the population is older, they will invest more in healthcare services. If we change our scale to a regional scale, we can see regional governments, such as state governments in the United States, that will use data to allocate state funds for infrastructure projects, social services, and pass laws for the region to reflect the needs and wants of the people. Nationally, we can see federal governments use data to decide what federal laws and programs should be created and kept in place. Oftentimes, national governments will look at what regional governments have done to see if it would work on a national scale. On a global scale, we can look at supranational organizations, such as the United Nations, which looks at the current state of the world. These organizations look at geospatial data to help counter war, famine, epidemics, and conflicts between different nations, all to help make the world a better place. And it isn't just governments that use data. Businesses do as well. Businesses use geospatial data to not only understand the needs and wants of their customers, but also their operations. On a local scale, businesses may use information that is organized by census tracts to better understand the median income of an area. This will allow them to open stores in neighborhoods where their customers are located. On a regional scale, businesses can compare different store sales to look for areas that are more favorable for the business, such as regions that have a lower tax rate for businesses or a higher percentage of workers with the skills that are desirable. Nationally, businesses look to see how different stores and offices are performing around the country to better identify good company policy. Businesses will also look for trends that are occurring nationally, which could be used to increase productivity and sales of regional branches. If we change our scale to the global scale, we can see that businesses will look for new sources of resources, workers, ideas, and markets to expand their business to. They will use geographic data to understand changes in the global market to look for developing economies for either the production of goods or possibly new markets to sell their goods. Lastly, individuals use geographic data in their lives as well. On a local scale, we can see people use geospatial data to help get them from place A to place B by using their GPS. Individuals looking to move into a new house might use thematic maps to look at crime rates in a neighborhood, commute times, or check to see what services exist in an area. On a regional scale, we can see individuals look at different opportunities in an area and compare them to the surrounding region. For example, in the United States, the 50 states often have similar laws and systems in place, but each state does differ in their legislative policies, which allows people to compare the performance of each state to see which policies work the best. On a national scale, individuals will look at how their country performs economically and socially when trying to decide which individuals to vote for. Oftentimes, individuals look at different data and information to inform themselves on the type of leadership they want for their country. 
lastly, we could look at the global scale, where individuals look at geospatial data to better understand the world in which they live, compare different countries, and to gain insight into the different global systems that impact them. Notice how each time we change our scale, we gain different levels of insight into the data. And the more that we start to zoom out, the more general the data becomes. Now, we've been talking for a while now about different geographic data and how it can show different spatial patterns. But let's dive deeper into some of these spatial concepts we've been talking about. To start, you want to make sure that you remember the difference between absolute and relative location. And notice that I said location, not direction or distance. We already talked about those terms earlier in this video. Absolute location is an exact location on the Earth's surface. It uses longitude and latitude. Think about your phone and GPS. The name of a location may change over time, but those coordinates will always remain the same. Relative location, on the other hand, is the relation a place has to the surrounding area. For example, if I was to describe my location using the different buildings around me or geographic features of the area, it's not exact like absolute location, but it can still help you with figuring out a person's location. So in talking about a place, we are talking about its physical and human characteristics. Physical characteristics are things like rivers, mountains, vegetation, or climate of an area. Whereas the human characteristics would be things such as the languages spoken in an area, the religions that are practiced, the amount of people living in a place, the cultures that are present in the area, or other general demographic data. Both physical and human characteristics provide a location, a sense of place. This is an emotional response that helps form a person's perception of a place. The more unique a place is, or the more memories you have of a place, the stronger the sense of place. Now, sometimes certain locations do not invoke any strong feelings from people, and they lack unique features that help the location stand out. This could cause a location to have placelessness, which is when a place seems to lack an identity. One of the ways we can gain insight into a place is by observing the spatial associations that exist within a place. When looking at a place, geographers will look at the spatial distribution of the place, which consists of density, concentration, and any patterns that may be present. Concentration looks at how things are spread out. Objects may be clustered together or dispersed. Density looks at the amount of objects or people in an area. For example, urban areas are often more densely populated since more people live there compared to rural areas. Lastly, pattern is the arrangement of things in an area, such as if objects are in a grid formation or a linear pattern. When we observe different spatial distributions of a place, we can gain a better understanding of the flow, the use, the purpose, and culture of that place. For example, look around your classroom the next time you are in it. How are the desks arranged? Are they spaced out facing the front of the room, or are they clustered together in pods? Each of these different arrangements tells you something about how the classroom will be used. If the desks are all in a line facing the front of the room with space between the desks, odds are you'll be listening to the teacher more and talking with your peers less. But if your desks are clustered together, you will probably be talking with your peers, working on group projects, or having more interactions with other students. So we can see that we can learn a lot about a place just from observing it. But in order to truly understand a place, we also need to understand its connections with other places. The world today is more connected than ever before, thanks to advancements in technology and communication. It's easier than ever to travel, communicate, trade, and interact with places and people all over the world. All of these connections make the world feel that much smaller. This phenomenon is known as time-space compression. Traditionally, places and people were impacted more by distance decay, which is a geographic concept that looks at how likely a person or place is to interact with another person or place. The farther the people or places are apart, the less likely they are to interact. This is why you are more likely to hang out with people that attend your school instead of a school on the other side of town, or why you are more likely to shop at stores near you instead of in another city. But thanks to the advancements in technology, the impact of distance decay has decreased as it's become easier than ever to interact with other places and people around the world. Okay, so we've been talking about how places interact with other places, but now we need to talk about how places interact with the environment. When looking at human environment interaction, we can see that society impacts the environment, and the environment in turn impacts society. The idea of environmental determinism looked at this relationship between the environment and society. And while it is no longer as widely accepted, it still provides us insight into the role of the environment and society. Determinism believes that the environment dictates the success of a society. Certain environments allow for a society to thrive and succeed, while other environments restrict a society. Society. Over time, people started to criticize environmental determinism for promoting European imperialism and for
for discounting the role of humans and their ability to adapt to adversity. Today, many people believe in environmental possibilism, which is the idea that the environment puts limits on a society. But people have the ability to adjust the physical environment and create their own success. Remember, environmental determinism believes that the environment determines the culture, and possibilism believes that the environment and culture both influence each other. One of the ways in which we can see society today change their local environment is by repurposing their land for specific purposes. This is known as land use. Land that is used for agricultural use is utilized for the production of different agricultural products, both for human consumption and animal consumption. Land used for industrial land consists of factories and manufacturing facilities that produce different products for society. Land designated for commercial use is for businesses and stores to sell their final goods and services. Then there is residential land use, which is land that is designated for people to live on and build homes on. Recreational land use is land that's been set aside for people in society to relax and unwind on, such as land dedicated to football stadiums, parks, or campsites. And lastly, there is transportational land use, which is land that is designated for roads, railroads, airports, ports, or public transportation, such as subway. This is what allows people and goods to get around a society. By understanding a society's land use patterns, we gain insight into what industries they prioritize, what cultural values they have, and how society designates their land to meet the different wants and needs of their people. Now, when societies seek to meet their wants and needs, they will consume natural resources, which are resources that are produced in nature. Natural resources consist of renewable resources, such as crops and trees. These resources can be used multiple times without running out. Then there is non-renewable resources, such as oil and natural gas. Once the resource is used, it's gone. It's important that societies around the world create sustainable policies to help their society become more sustainable. When societies are sustainable, they ensure that they use the Earth's natural resources in a manner that allows them to meet their wants and needs without compromising future generations from doing the same. Okay, so we've talked about the environment, places, spatial associations, and data, but now we need to talk about scale and scale of analysis. Remember, scale is the distance on a map in relation to the corresponding distance on the Earth's surface. There is a global scale, national scale, regional scale, and local scale. And if we want to get even more detailed with our scale, we can also look at categories such as the sub-national scale or sub-state scale, which is below the national scale. This would include looking at a map of a city, county, region, or even a census tract, which is one of the smallest classifications of a geographic area. Now, when talking about scales of analysis, we will still use global, national, regional, and local scale. But with scales of analysis, we're trying to understand how the information and data is being organized and presented. A global scale of analysis does not use countries' boundaries to present the information. Instead, it shows global patterns. The information here is not connected to any one country, making this map here a global scale map and a global scale of analysis. A national scale of analysis has the data and information organized by the country. Here we can see we have a global scale map, but notice how the data is organized by each country. Since the data is connected to specific countries, it makes this a national scale of analysis. A regional scale of analysis can be displayed in a variety of different ways, but here we can see that we have a national scale map. However, the information is being organized into different Federal Reserve districts, making this a regional scale of analysis. Lastly, here we can see we have a local scale of analysis. Notice how the information that is being presented in this map is organized by the different counties in the United States. One thing you'll want to notice is that as we change our scale from a global scale to a local scale, you're able to get more details in the information. Small scale maps such as this one use more generalizations to present the data since the maps are more zoomed out, while large scale maps such as this one have more details and use less generalization since the maps are zoomed in. Oftentimes students get confused with small and large scale maps. Remember, small scale maps are zoomed out and large scale maps are zoomed in. Whenever we change our scale, we can observe different spatial associations, patterns, and gain insight into different geographic areas. Now both scale and scale of analysis can be confusing for students. So what I want you to do now is complete the table in your study guide. If you need help completing the table, you can also check out my exclusive videos and practice problems in the ultimate review packet to help you make sure that you're understanding everything. All right, now moving on from scale of analysis to regional analysis, we can see that we have three main different types of regions. Remember, a region is a geographic area that is defined by one or more unique characteristics or certain patterns of activity. There are formal regions, also known as uniform 
fusiform regions. These are geographic areas that have common attributes and are traditionally defined by economic, political, social, or environmental characteristics. For example, political boundaries in Latin America create formal regions that are states. Or the Rocky Mountains create a formal physical region in the United States. Functional regions, also known as nodal regions, are geographic areas that are organized around a node or center point. Oftentimes, the node or center point is based around a specific economic activity, travel, or communication. Airports, radio stations, power plants, or subway stations all create functional regions. Lastly, there are perceptual regions, also known as vernacular regions. These are geographic areas that are linked together due to people's opinions, attitudes, feelings, or beliefs on the region. These regions exist in people's minds and do not have a perfect definition. These regions will differ depending on who you talk to. For example, the Middle East is a perceptual region. Depending on who you talk to, each person has a different idea of what countries are part of the Middle East. One general rule of thumb to remember is that if a region is based on the cardinal directions, it is most likely a perceptual region. Since when using cardinal directions, we are looking at relative location and direction. Over time, we see regions change, overlap, and become contested. This is especially true if we change our scale of our information. And there you have it, geographers. We are done with unit one. Now, don't forget to check your answers to the study guide in the answer key in my ultimate review pack. And to also take the unit one practice quiz to make sure you're ready for your unit one test. Remember, if you found value in this video and you want to see more human geography content, then also make sure to subscribe and join me for unit two. As always, I'm Mr. Sin, and I will see you next time online.